So I'm going to go right ahead and get started. My name is Z Dempster. I am the Assistant Director at IRIDAC, which stands for the Institute for Research on the Afghan Diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. And seeing that we have extra waters here, if anybody can repeat that name, you'll get a free bottle of water. <laughs> Let me put on the glasses. First of all, I won't take up too much of your time, but I do want to thank public programs, um, Karen Sanders and her team, um, Jimmy and Tim, who were the co-sponsors of this event, who really helped us to put it together. And without the support, their support, this would not have been set up and done as smoothly. So I, I thank them so much at public programs. And uh, we feel very privileged um, to have the guests that are here tonight. Um, and I will start by reading just a little bit about both of them. Gregory Pardlow is the author of Totem, winner of the APR Honickman First Book Prize, and Digest, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. The Pulitzer judges cited his clear voice poems that bring readers the news from 20th century America, rich with thought, ideas, and histories, public and private. His other honors include fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. He is poetry editor for the Virginia Quarterly Review and an associate editor for the liter literary journal, Kalalu. His memoir and collection of essays, Air Traffic, was released this month. He is currently teaching creative writing at Columbia University. And Vivi Francis is here also with us tonight. She is the author of three books of poetry, Blue Tail Fly, Horse in the Dark, which is the winner of the Cave Cayman Northwestern University Poetry Prize for a second collection, and Forest Primeval, winner of the Horston Wright Legacy Award and the 2017 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Her work has appeared in numerous print and online journals, textbooks, and anthologies, including Poetry, Best American Poetry 2010, 2014, 20, and 2017, and Angles of Ascent, a Norton anthology of contemporary African American poetry. She has been a participant in the Cave Cayman Workshops, a poet in residence for the Alice Lloyd Scholars Program at the University of Michigan, and teaches poetry writing in the Kalalu Creative Writing Workshop. In 2009, she received a Rona Jaff Writers Award and in 2010, a Kresge Fellowship. She serves as an associate editor of Kalalu and is an associate professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. So without further ado, I introduce to you Gregory Pardlow and Vivi Francis, Race and Labor in Poetry and Memoir. Thank you. Thank you, Z. Thank you very much. We apologize for the little slight delay there. He's looking at me. I, 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 I want very much to, to throw my colleague under the bus here. Yes, he does. <laughs> but I will, <laughs> I will refrain <laughs> nobly. <laughs> so uh, just to give you a sense of why we're here, um, race, uh, labor obviously is a big theme of the memoir, Air Traffic. And I was thinking about um, not only the ways that, that it operates in the book, but also how how it serves as a kind of anxiety, this ever-present, I don't know about anxiety, it's probably too strong a word, but this ever-present question or concern, how race and labor intertwine to uh, contextualize a lot of our, both of our practices. Um, one part of that is that my father, there seemed, my father seemed to have this ever-present um, implicit criticism that what I do is, was not real work. And I think this is a, this is a common, common concern, common issue. Um, and I was always trying to regain or gain his approval. And that self-consciousness, I think, uh, worked its way into my poems and 
I don't know, in, insidious ways and, and productive ways as well. And the other part of this is that Vivi and I have been carrying on this conversation for the better part of a decade now. Um, and as you can imagine, two friends who are deeply respectful and, and caring of one another, affectionate with one another, uh, we've learned how to disagree very productively, I think. And, and so and we often. thought... And, <laughs> <laughs> and so we wanted to, uh, to open up that conversation. So we're, we're just as curious uh, to engage with you all as we are to share our thoughts on, um, on our work. So thank you again for coming. I'm going to let Vivi begin. We thought that we'd read um, a few of our poems and then talk some things through. I'm choosing poems from Forest Primeval because I'm really, if you had to place me in a class, I'm agrarian class. Um, both my parents grew up um, on farms or farmer ranches in um, Texas, where you would often, you wouldn't just have a farm, you'd have to have cattle. So there were herd of cattle, this type of thing. Um, and then at 14, my father moved to Detroit for the same reason almost everyone moves to Detroit, the car companies. And while he was there, he engaged in a, a lot of labor disputes. He was a negotiator. Um, with Blue Cross, uh, Blue Shield eventually, but prior with General Motors, and he'd have to negotiate with the unions all of the time. But I still see myself as primarily agrarian class, and eventually, um, about six years ago, my husband, who I met in Detroit, and I moved to the mountains of western North Carolina. And that forced me to reckon again with class and status and who was I and how much of me was still agrarian and how much of me was urban, discovered that I was truly urban by that point. Um, and Detroit urban, feeling myself to be tough the way Detroiters often feel. We're quiet about it because we don't need to tell. And um, then I moved to Western North Carolina inside of nature and found that I was afraid of everything. And those who were tough were those in the rural class, those who were constantly at labor with body and mind. So I'll read a few poems from Forest Primeval. Another anti-pastoral. I want to put down what the mountain has awakened, my mouth full of grass, my curious tail. I want to stand still but find myself moved patch by, by patch. There's a bleed in my throat. Words fail me here, can you understand? I sink to my knees, tired or not. I now know the ragweed from the goldenrod and the blinding beauty of green. Don't you see, I'm shedding my skins. I am a paper hive, a wolf spider, the creeping ivy, the ache of a birch, a doe, a heifer. I have fallen from my dream of progress, the clear cut glass, the potted and balconied tree, the lemon waxed wood over a marbled pillar, into my own nocturne, the lullabies I had forgotten. How could I know what slept inside, what would rend my fantasies to cud, and up from this belly's wet straw-strewn field, these soundings. Keys. This takes place when um, I'd been in the mountains and I went back to Detroit for a visit. The cathedral, two blocks away from a flat in a city where I used to live, chimes every morning at dawn, and the sound is vague, whereas the rounds fired off on a random evening when I went back to visit were clear. Moving through the air with such clarity, I stayed down flat on the bed with an arm thrown over my still-sleeping husband until it was over. Though next time a window may shatter or the skull of the old man a house or so over, I found four shells the next morning in the side yard. Sometimes the early bells toll a song I recall from a childhood spent in a church dotted south. Though those whitewashed churches lack the ornament, ornament of St. Florian's I've come to covet. When there's a knock on the back door, I don't answer. Of course, there are those who don't knock but try the knob or key my car on the curb because I have a car. 
and that is enough to inspire hate in someone spilling out of Kelly's bar next door who is saved for nothing but a week of drinks downed in a single night. Salvation works that way. A man begins to thirst for what closed-eyed he saw glinting like mica in a stream, and he reached from the bank of his dreams to cup that coin, to bring it wet to the lips. I understand. I too can almost taste it, the metal and the rapids moving through me, entering the way the promise of bells enters. Yes, I might be saved by such a stream if only temporarily. But consider the way the man that keyed my car felt momentarily assuaged by bourbon, a drink he felt to be a drink of class to forget he had been accused of having none. Until he saw the car, daring to sit on its tires like a sign saying, you who have nothing, he thought he was okay, thought the night had carried him to the river of forgetting, the Lethe, I get it. But I don't blame strangers for possessing what I do not. And I don't expect the water to be anything other than what the water is. I think I'll stop with just this couple. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you. So I'm going to, and I, and I hope we do get to read a, a couple more here, a couple of more, or, yeah. or it's another later on. Um, so you inspired me to change what I had planned to read. <coughs> now instead, uh, just to, to set the, this scene, the premise of the book, the book kind of centers on the air traffic control strike of 1981. My father was a controller and, when, uh, re and rather than negotiate with the union, Reagan fired uh, almost 13,000 federal employees. And the book follows the ups and downs of uh, my father's career um, in addition to my own developing subjectivity. This is obviously situated later. The title is The Strip. He was already stubbing out his cigarette in the planter as I hooked the Econoline van around to meet him under the carport of the Willow Grove Hampton Inn. His hair was still wavy, I could see, kind of Latin, and raked with silver. It had been so long since I last saw him, I wasn't sure whether he was still straightening it or if the follicles had simply wilted with age. Not many years before this, he was routinely mistaken for the plump, middle-aged Al Sharpton. <laughs> I wondered if people also mistook him for the caved-in, pencil-necked person Sharpton became. <laughs> he was thin, my dad, as if he ought to be sporting a walking staff in dhoti. This shocked me. I wanted it to be a trick of the light, and as I squinted and craned my head forward, I clipped the curb causing the empty van to buck then rumble like an oil drum. Getting in, he groaned as he pulled himself up with the handle above the door frame. The worst part is the loss of strength, he said without even commenting on my driving, though his fingers remained wrapped around the handle above him once he was securely in. <clears throat> the veins on his wrist were big as soft drink straws, and I could make out the bulge of the shunt peeking from where his silk shirt and leather jacket sleeves bunched down past his elbow on the raised arm. His clothes were sized for a much larger man than this new father of mine. It had been almost two years since his near fatal kidney failure. That failure, occurring not long after my parents' separation, resulted from sustained attempts to regulate his blood sugar with Mountain Dew and Thin Mints. He'd only recently begun submitting to regular dialysis treatments, surrendering his freedom for 12 hours a week. Suffice it to say, he was reluctant, half hoping intervention from the eternal footman might render the matter moot. I wanted to say something about global warming, why we could wear jackets in the middle of February instead of proper coats, but I didn't want to provoke a rant about hopelessness in the world's end. Just look at the damn space program, he'd offer in a Miles Davis rasp in our most recent phone calls. The shuttle Atlantis, like a moat of jeweler's dust, had barely scratched the atmosphere on re-entry and touched down at the Kennedy Space Center before NASA workers were packing up the booms and rigging of the entire program, folding the lion cages, rolling up the tent. A sign, my father said, that mankind would never again breach the heavens in search of forbi the forbidden absolute. A sign that we'd given up and that there wouldn't be a generation like his again for some time to come if ever. Sensing his mortality, 
He wanted to synchronize his life with historic events. He imagined himself a rare species of comet. He scanned newspapers for hard proof of the providential timing of his exit. He kept a pair of pliers on the kitchen counter at his place in Vegas. He said it was the only way he could open anything with a twist top. I allowed myself to picture what his kitchen might look like by collaging descriptions he'd given me with what I knew of my father's lifestyle and impatience for decorating. I pictured counters littered with a bachelor's corkscrew, toaster oven, coffee maker, pliers, and then some kind of reclining chair in the living room centered on a plasma TV just beyond the breakfast bar, sunlight slipping under a window shade like a hotel bill. Perhaps my father made an awkward attempt to personalize the furnished space with a framed poster of Worf, his favorite Star Trek character. He would have purchased the, the poster from some tourist shop around the corner. Alone, he would have been even less circumspect about the Ziploc baggies and amber glass vials emptied of blow and strewn across the glass top of a faux wicker coffee table. Did he have pictures of his family? Ginger, my wife and I, had once given him an electronic picture frame loaded with a dozen digital photos of us. There was Sarah building little houses out of twigs in the park. And there was Ginger, fake freckled in a pippy long stocking costume, holding Fita, the fluffy green dinosaur with her plastic pumpkin container for trick-or-treating. And there I was, at a podium, reading before an audience at the Brooklyn Public, Public Library. He claimed he didn't get poetry. In sports, you know who's best, right? It's the guy who crosses the finish line first, the guy left standing over the crumpled body of his opponent. Poetry, my dad said, is like a game at a children's birthday party. What's the point if everybody wins? <laughs> <laughs> Writing is its own reward, I explained to him many times. <laughs> but I couldn't help wishing I was raising a Super Bowl trophy over my head in that photo. I told myself he liked the picture frame. Back in Willow Grove, it was propped beside his chair on the shelf that doubled as a TV table, offering glimpses of the future illumined through the haze of cigarette smoke and cat hair. Why Vegas? I asked him finally. I looked over to where he sat in the passenger seat. He ticked off each finger like light switches a view of the strip, a culture of moral relativism, <laughs> the best emergency response times in the country, a devastated housing market, and legal prostitution. Then, bearing his palms as if in supplication to rest his case, the weight of his argument almost too much to hold, an oyster bar. You can find a town with a better reputation for seafood, you know. Entire cultures, even. I'm not you, he said, before adding, I don't like foreigners in my country. Why would I bother with them in theirs? I'd heard, <laughs> I'd heard variations of this list before. None of the reasons had ever been satisfying to me. The one item in each recitation that had a shiver of living truth like a spotted banana in an arrangement of plastic fruit, was that view of the strip. He was in Vegas a while before I realized what that must have meant to him all those years later. The view, a tower rising out of the desert, a landscape so much like Oklahoma. In images of Vegas I pulled up on the web, the strip looked like an airport runway at night, edge lights along the boulevard narrowing to an arrowhead aimed at the dark flank of the mountain. I heard you found some kind of high-tech jiffy lube, I said as I pulled out onto the main road. He chuckled. Looks like a damn massage parlor. The last place, I swear they used a cheesecloth to filter my blood. It took days. A beat. But this place, in and out. And then a sigh. For my kidney to be pecked out again another day. Easton Road snaked, snaked to the right after braiding once with York Road through big box stores and restaurant chains. We followed the bend around Toys R Us. I talked to Mommy, I said. It sounds like it, he answered. I tried to be patient, to separate the man who was my father from the guy who owed my mother alimony. Dragging my ass up and down the turnpike like Sparky for what? I didn't turn to look at him. I didn't have to. 
I could sense his ex is it, I'm sorry. I could sense his expectant eyes on me. Sparky. In tribute and reflex, I responded silently. What do you call a dog with no hind legs and steel balls? His pause was calculated to give me time to process his subtle wit, which was more important than his indignation for having been made to commute up and down the turnpike for so many years. You know how bad she jacked me in the divorce, huh? I mean, where am I supposed to get all this money she's asking for? She doesn't get to hold my life hostage. What about the car? It was a Mercedes, a two-seater convertible, silver with burgundy interior. The car, he puffed, waving the air as if I was a bug he was forced to swat from his face. I know you've got some thing against the car. He leaned over as, as if about to show me the secret to whistling through my fingers. And it's not even that you really want me to give your mother a piece of the car, is it? You just don't want me to have it. It was true. I failed to see what a senior citizen on dialysis and a fixed income could need with a $60,000 sports car. <laughs> it was wasteful and stupid. Doesn't matter what I think about the car, Dad. Just that in the world the rest of us live in, you can't fucking afford it. We were headed to the storage facility to collect the stuff he didn't ship before driving the car from Willow Grove to Vegas. He had stopped, he had stopped paying the mortgage he'd taken out on Willow Grove, and my mother moved back to Tinker Place, which was quieter now that my brother's group had broken up, uh, music group had broken up, and Robbie was trying to get sober. My dad had hired someone to move his remaining items into a storage facility before the bank boarded up the house. He couldn't afford storage any longer. Some of those things would be going to my house in Brooklyn. Others he would pack up to take on the plane with him back to Vegas. Look, I'm not going to defend the car, all right? I earned it. I deserve it. She gets to have her gray-haired prom, right? So now it's my turn to squish my toes in the ice cream. You're keeping the car out of spite, Dad, and you know it. Not because you're actually getting any enjoyment out of it. You're like Sarah, stuffing the last few cookies into her mouth just so her sister won't get any. <laughs> For hate's sake, he growled. I spit my last breath at thee. He was quoting Khan. I might have told him that Khan was quoting Ahab, but why bother? <laughs> we idled in the... <laughs> We idled in the middle of the intersection, holding traffic as I waited to turn into the lot. The turn signal was ticking. What I did know was that the car was the last sentimental keepsake of his former life, the life in which he enjoyed social ties and family relations. What I didn't know yet, what would come as no surprise, was that my father was careening down the steep side of an opiate addiction. He escaped to Vegas to be free of oversight and the stifling care of loved ones. His move marked the first time my dad lived outside the Delaware Valley. It was a, re it was a regression, a return to the traumatic moment of departure, before, departure from the glorious future his adolescence had, 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 sorry, had heralded. I always stumble at the parts where it starts to get a little emotional for me. I notice now. I imagine he was a rising, junior, a rising high school junior debating the merits of his reach school. He would choose UNLV because it was in Vegas, and he'd choose Vegas because Disneyland had neither a university nor naked ladies. <laughs> Vegas spun illusions out of the surplus of life's unyielding truths. My dad was impatient with the limits of truth. This thought exercise allowed me to meet my father as a peer and a friend, and the beginning of that promising friendship made the most fitting end to the story we shared. Thanks. So, yeah, Do, you, had, you had, yeah, go ahead. I did have yes. a, I didn't know my face. Um, I, I think that that's a wonderful segue into, into fathers and labor. So I'm, I'm interested in, in how your view of labor differs from your father's view of labor, and also uh, really interested in how you relate poetics and labor, and in thinking about what your father wanted and didn't want for you regarding poetry? I'm, that's a, the, a question. I'm not sure what he wanted for me because I think he was too narcissistic to think about what I would become or what future I had ahead of me. Mm -hmm. um, but my, and I, I refer to it obviously in the, the passage I just read, his 
idea of labor was sacrifice. It was there was suffering involved. There, you know, um, and the the fact <laughs> he he. I, I can confidently say he resented the fact that I enjoyed doing what I do. Um, and th there was a third question about, oh, labor and, and poetics? Or? How, it, how poetry is labor for you? How, if he mm. thought of labor as sacrifice, how do you think of it? And my father, too, thought of it as sacrifice. Yeah. Well, I think of it as, as production, as... Um, Production in the sense of being productive in relation to a, co a chosen community. And so my chosen community happens to be the literary community slash academia. And, you know, that's where I, I feel welcome, comfortable, like I belong. Um, and I, there's something, there's a, a part of me that wishes there were a greater connection between the the life of the of the ivory tower and the life of the the union workers that my that my the community that my father had chosen to to belong to and i think part of this book what i'm trying to do in this book is to bridge that gap in some ways well his community uh, the men he saw as laborers with him other air traffic controllers, that's wrested away from him. Yeah. So thus, in his case, making it harder for him to allow you to do the thing you love and see it as work. But we talked earlier about um, both of our parents not seeing um, poetry as labor, as, as real work, although it takes real work to write. It, it doesn't take real work if you're following the mythologies of poetry. In other words, if, if you're not using the poetry as part of a kind of public discourse, in other words, entering the conversation along with other poets, then it may require something different because then it's a different type of poetry actually, right? So then you're writing whatever you're writing out of the heart, even off the top of the head, there's not necessarily the, the push may pull you towards a revision and because the conversation is only when you're having with self or with family. But once it moves out of that realm of self and family into more public discourse, into publication, I think that there are, there are, it's work. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're For me, and I know for you, you won't admit it, will you? It's daily yeah, work. No, it is. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I do think so. So my mother was a, a commercial artist, and, you know, we could, the, 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 the kind of psychological reading of, of me is pretty obvious in, in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so she was a commercial artist, and I grew up watching her crank out. She worked for the Yellow Pages, and so she designed Yellow Page ads, and she would crank them out all night long, late long, it was piecework too. Um, and so my association with making art is, uh, you know, your butt's in the seat and you're, you're at it for, for hours, right? And I, th I, I think you're, you're pointing out the myth, uh, the mythology of it's uh, easy. creative production in, in poetry is that you know, we're not doing anything. We're we're waiting for the muse to strike, and and you know, and it just kind of we just we let channel the, it. And we're we're channeling it right moves down through the head <laughs> into the heart, where it stirs, and then out through the arm, and thus I write. And 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 poets and poets often will play into that myth and and, and pretend it. to be divinely inspired in some way, and and hide the fact that you know we're <coughs> we're diligently working late into the into the night. Sweating over, um, you know, words and line line breaks and right. images. <coughs> I swallowed my water wrongly. Um, so I wanted to relate the story I related to you. Uh, my father was actually an artist yeah. <clears throat> before Vietnam. Uh, I recall as a child seeing him paint and create before Vietnam. And then he went to Vietnam, came back, and he just has a natural eye. It's, it's really incredible, but not a studied eye anymore. 
And slowly he stopped painting, the sketching stopped, and um, all three of his children uh, were all inside of language, we all write. My sister's a speech pathologist. My brother works for um, uh, Dell International, so he's learning different languages. He goes to different parts of the world, this type of thing. Um, but he kind of gave up on, on his writing because he didn't see it as real work or work that would provide an income, hmm. which was real work for him. One, you have to sacrifice. Two, you have to make an income, and he did both. So after I was born, he went into business, and he was quite good at it. And then he went into labor negotiations, and he was quite good at it. And he moved you know, through several different economic classes. But I remember finding his poetry. I found poetry, I believe it was in his army trunk. I have never seen a man so angry. He had never told me that he had written poems. And there were two poems. And I am running to him. These are really good, Dad. And one, he didn't want me telling him it was good or not. And two, <laughs> there I was. He thought I was going to be a lawyer. You're black. You're glib. You're going to be a lawyer. No. <laughs> I didn't want to be a lawyer. He had his dreams for me all laid out, but they were not my dreams for me. I knew by somewhere between 19 and 24, by 24 I called myself a poet, understood myself that way, and knew that that was what I was going to do forever. Now I'm 54, so clearly I meant it. Um, and now he's perfectly on board with me. But he had a very difficult time. How are you going to live? How are you going to make it? And it wasn't easy, it was painful for me because he was not going to engage in my rabbit hole and my, my illusion of poetics even though he loved poetry. Mm -hmm. And I remember us arguing and my saying, where do you think the people that write those things come from? Mm -hmm. And who do you think they are? They cannot live the life you are now leading and do what I'm doing. So the sacrifice is met in other ways. And I think that started him really on the path toward understanding what I do. And I'll finish up with this, which I told you early, until a few weeks ago at Dartmouth, I was giving a class for Dartmouth parents. And the night before I asked my father, what would you say to those parents? They're very much like you. They wanna make sure that their children are able to make a livelihood. So he wrote me this beautiful passage. And I read it to them, and they were moved. I mean, moved to tears. And then I said, really? Really? Where was that man when I was 19? <laughs> right? So what I wanted the parents to understand is that poetry is not, I don't think of it as just a labor of love, that you just kind of, like this magic, where you just take your heart and pour your heart out. I think of it as quite more than that. Um, and I, I definitely see it as a kind of labor, but labor for me does not necessarily mean resentment. I don't have to, I'm not working a job that I feel disdain for. And I actually made my living as a poet for several years. Okay, if you could call it a living, I was very, very poor. But, you know, it, it is possible. Um, but it depends on what you want to give up materially and how much you're, that's the sacrifice for me. The sacrifice was material. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think there's something <clears throat> about, um, we're talking about class, mm -hmm. but on the one hand there is a class that is in, sort of demarcated along the financial scale. And then there is, there is our desire, and I think we share this desire yeah. to participate in an economy that is not based on material capital, but rather cultural capital. Um, and I think that's hard for our parents to uh, to grasp, and it's hard for it's not a narrative that is uh, that translates well in, in America. And the um, as you're talking, I'm thinking about the the race part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we, uh, you know, people of color, immigrants, African Americans, don't normally give, we don't give ourselves nor our children the opportunity to, you know, choose to participate in alternative economies, right? And not only do we not, I and mean, we do that out of a sense of defensiveness, of protection, 
because, you know, if you're not caring for it, the world is going to kick you in the pants quite enough. And if you're not sort of nailed down by material circumstances and protected by a secure, you know, uh, um, livelihood or profession, then you're making yourself vulnerable to society in ways that are, um, that can, in fact, be mortal. I think that that is something that African, those who identify as African American and immigrants share, that, yeah. that it, with our parents, that sensibility. And I think Southern parents too, uh, Southern black parents can, not everyone, but even two, three generations into the middle class, we can get stuck at this sustenance level, right? mm -hmm. stuck in mm -hmm. thinking, well, this is it. Now we're surviving. Now we have the house. Now we have the car. Once we hit the middle class, we're good. Right? And so I know as my family moved economically, our values were always middle class. But as we moved economically into the middle class, I, I remember this argument I had with my family because we were still stuck in survival mode. And I remember just screaming at my father, we didn't move through civil rights so that I could be white middle class. We moved through civil rights so that I could have a choice mm -hmm. about the life I wanted to lead. And I remember that shocking my father. He hadn't mm -hmm. thought of it that way. And I said, and you now have a choice in things. Like I'm really trying to get him to write a book right now. He wants to write a book, but he, he recently told me, well, writing is hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> You know, we're, we're talking about re resentment, and you, you remind me that I, I think that was another piece of what my father resented was the, the fact that I could choose not to participate in the material economy in the same ways that, that he had. Right? So there's, there's a... Which means that ideas, well, you're not quite my age. You're a, you're a little Two younger. younger. Two on, years younger. Come on. Yeah. So... Um, ideas of, around labor and what that means are, are shifting, are changing. Um, and I think necessarily so. So we allow ourselves more options. Mm -hmm. And also if we get more options, if the options broaden and we don't take them, that's problematic. And particularly that the, the labor market is changing. Right? Yes, it so is. The, so the, the, the jobs with the hands um, using ones. And I'm thinking too about your, your pastoral, anti-pastoral, mm -hmm. how so much of the work that's available is, um, um, what do you call it, electronic. Tech. Tech. <laughs> that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, we'd love to bring you guys into the, the conversation, invite you into the conversation. Um, comments, questions, uh, beefs, <laughs> grievances. And, and believe it or not, this really is the conversation we have all, this is what we'd be saying if we were just sitting with each other over lunch and one or the other of us would pull out a notebook and say, say that again? Yeah. And we'd start <laughs> writing. And I mean, and this has been going on for almost 10 years. And we do argue, many, some people in the audience have seen us argue, we'll, we'll fight it out. But um, it, it helps to have someone to be able to bounce ideas yeah. off of. We have very different backgrounds. So. Please, hi. Well, uh, you developed a lot of ideas, really. <laughs> Oh, yes. I'm willing, this by the way, not to record you. It's to oh. hear you. Oh. <laughs> you use the mics beautifully. Not everybody does, and I was worried that I wouldn't catch every uh. word. But I think there's something, I guess I have to speak for your dad's, both your dad's generations, because you're the age of my kids. And uh, they, they did give you a terrific gift because they challenged you and challenge your thinking. And I, I was thinking of a poem came to my mind that was the antithesis of that, which maybe you know it. It's those winter Sundays, you know, Robert Oh, Hill. yes. Yeah. And Very he, well. his dad did that out in the cold mm -hmm. labor, the real hands-on labor. And Hayden says in this poem, and no one ever thanked him. But, his, but there was such a separation between him and his son and his kids that he couldn't raise those kinds of mm. questions or wouldn't have, wouldn't have known how to 
broach that. Mm -hmm. And it took his son so many years later to think back. And, and you had your line, Vivi, where you said, how can I know what slept inside? And he says it in his poem, how could I know what love meant? It's austere you know, and lonely love's offices. Love's austere and lonely yeah. offices. Yeah. So you really, I just want to thank yeah. you, because I think you evoked so many yeah. thoughts. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's interesting it what you're saying. My, my father is um, in his 70s now, and you're saying that he challenged my thinking. He did, but I challenged his. And now, at this point in his life, he's, he's really doing some of the things, I believe he's doing some of the things artistically that he's been wanting to do. And I think that that is uh, mm -hmm. when the children challenge the parent. It's not that we don't thank them or that we don't know what they've done. My father sacrificed a great deal for me, but I had to challenge him. And I didn't just challenge him for me. I challenged him for him. And I think you challenged your father more often than not for your father as well. If he'd only lis have listened. <laughs> right. <laughs> Jason. Hi. Um, so <clears throat> uh, a thing that I'm thinking about is the kind of reliance on the fixed image. So I'm thinking about uh, the car specifically, right? So the car in your, in your poem, Keys by the, and then the $60,000 car. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about like how class functions, yeah. right? So maybe um, if, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on those symbols of class and if your parents didn't have those respective symbols, right? How would it have been easier for them to negotiate this kind of rapid changes, these kind of rapid economic social changes? Or, you know, do you think that that kind of like factors in in any way, like what they were seeing, you know, mm -hmm. they wanted to hold on to? Well, yeah, my, my father was, was fiercely materialistic. Um, and I don't, I can't even imagine him not investing, not having his identity invested in these emblems of uh, these external projections of self-worth. Um, my mother was a, a little, no, my mother was pretty, my mother's pretty uh, materialistic as well. And so I, I think, um, I think part of my ability even to recognize an alternative economy is because of my parents' dependence on these these emblems. Now, if they wouldn't, I can't, they wouldn't be who they, right. who they yeah. are. My yeah. parents, um, I mean, I, I don't think, they're middle class African Americans, I don't think they'd mind me saying they're materialists. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And my my mother loved a Corvette, so you know, and and they had reached a point where they could afford the Corvette, you know. They loved their cars, and but to be honest, it's conflated for me because we lived in Detroit, and my father still has a house in Detroit, and it's difficult to live in Detroit and not think in terms of cars, uh, in my father's right. age or, or at my age. So, so the the car, what happens and. What happens is what kind of car, this type of thing. Um, I wasn't a materialist at all, and it drove my parents mad. I had no hunger for these things. The first time I hungered for a car was only recently. I bought my first non-American car, a Subaru. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that thing. <laughs> I do. But I felt guilt because I had, you know, grown up with a family for whom the car and the American, the so-called American-made car was so important. But um, yeah, I, I think they needed those external signs, but I think we all have those external signs in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm -hmm. Um, I Whether it's on a CV or... Yeah, um. it's, <laughs> you know, I become really aware of them and some of the signs are external but not seen, right? And some of those signs are in the simple swagger with which we walk down the street, you know. Um, so I've got mine, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Right? <laughs> uh, actually, it's over here. In the... Who's next? I'll come, I'll come back to you. I have a question, and I'm asking it in humbleness. Um, because I think about 
the uh, basic American story is the most deep story in America is is the theft of of labor. the labor of African Americans, mm -hmm. and for hundreds of years, you know, this country's built on the theft of of that labor and um, and the th and the theft of the land of the Indians, and mm -hmm. you know, it it just imaginatively seems to me that it would be a complicated relationship with being materialist or not materialist for African American people because everything is built on a deficit and theft of mm -hmm. all of this labor that, you know, I know that the savings of people of color is so much less than white people and that's because of the injustice that's been waged on people in so many institutional ways, mm -hmm. even now. And, you know, it's just a sickening wrong. So to reclaim your life as an individual when so many things are just blocked and so unfair. Mm -hmm. For me, that speaks to the power of black thought and black family. You know, even when the family collapses, even the challenges that you spoke of earlier, uh, black uh, tenacity, right? So I realized that my ability to live a life of the mind is, is bargained on my ancestors' backs, but that leads me to this. He does, he does, I'm gonna have to do this. So I think he, I brought Gregory's book because <laughs> I think he approaches that in his first poem, written by himself, which I actually have little notes here, because um, in written by himself, he, there really is the movement from slavery to emancipation. And so written by himself, if you were a slave and, or a newly freed slave and you wanted to write a memoir or biography, the story of your life, you would have to have someone white sign off on it. Yes. you know. He wrote it, whatever. So he speaks of that, but this is where in the main labor for the self begins. Right after emancipation, it's no longer labor for others. You own your life now, so it's labor for the self. So I think that's a really appropriate place for this to start, written by himself. This is the starting point for self-labor. And once the labor's for the self, it's going to take longer than 150 years to figure out what we do with that labor. One, by the time emancipation comes, who is that self? Especially if one has been enslaved and your name is taken, everything's taken, who you marry, your body is owned. So who is that self? So there's time to figure that out. And what to do with this labor, what kind of labor to do. So one of the reasons I'm so drawn to Gregory's work is the theoretical inside of these poems. The theoretical lets me know that he's moved out of thinking about the sustenance level alone, that he sees a future right, where, where we can just consider a life of the mind, where we can consider what else there is outside of materiality. And so... I think that's where we are now, and we're past, not that everything is done. We need to write around things at all levels, but someone has to write a text that allows for a future, and that's how I feel about this text. <laughs> mm -hmm. does, that, yeah, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are so many narratives that oppose the imagining of a future, and so the, if the um, we can't talk about labor in, in America without talking about the theft of labor, right? And we, we think about any, I mean, what is, what is slavery if not organized labor, right? And the, the you know, race is, uh, in a, a sense, uh, a means of organizing, of designating uh, the exploitable, the community for whom we can, who, whose labor can be exploited. Um, and so thinking around or thinking beyond these narratives, these tropes of um, uh, identifying labor with the, as we say, the black body, can be really threatening sometimes. And I, I, 
I'm still very surprised, <laughs> naively, when at by the the pushback of uh, readers sometimes of of all communities who um, who see that that effort to transcend as a uh, as a, a kind of uh, self hatred and a, and, a, and a negation uh, um, a, a disrespect of when it's a uh, deep respect it's ancestry. a respect that says I can allow for expansion I know my history I understand my history I respect it and because I respect it I now go forward. I can allow for a certain amount of expansion. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I really think that's, that's part of the work of the text, you know. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, oh, uh, so much of what you said resonated with me, um, particularly when you're talking about cultural uh, commodity and resentment with your parents. And I was thinking, uh, like my dad came to the city and um, you know he didn't go to college, neither of my parents did. And uh, like afterwards, I deleted my dad from Facebook when I was on Facebook because he made a joke and I was like, boom, you're done. <laughs> uh, like he had, a, he, like he, had uh, he had multiple warnings. Uh, and so there needed to be repercussions for his actions. Um, I put him on punishment uh, by deleting him, um, and he got pissed at me. And he was like, "I was like, well, this is a you know, this is a professional deal, like my Facebook." You know, he's like, uh, "Well, I'm sorry, I'm not getting rich off Facebook," which he told me. I was like, "Well, that ain't happening for me either." What are you talking about? He didn't understand that. He doesn't really understand, you know, like the whole writing like aspect of that. So, like to hear you guys, I was like, "Oh." You know, could you guys talk a little bit about like this negotiate? Because I can see in my own work how my father and I are still, and my mom, you know, are having this conversation. The same thing, like with the, you know, and how it just, you know, cyclical, you know. Uh, could you talk about this whole cultural commodity a little more and the resentment factor? And like maybe even, I know in air traffic you get in that and you know by like that is so much i see it in your work and you know the, the poems i've taught i've been like that resentment the anger the your father and that conversation you know and could you talk about like how it manifests in ways that are positive but also ways that are negative that you like are really working on yourself he's trying to start a fight <laughs> oh, I thought we specifically said, DTM, that um, you may not ask questions. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, my, my father and I have had an arc. He appears in this latest book. I, I didn't ask his permission for him to appear. And I think he's been gracious in accepting what's in the text. Um, but it, it's, it's taken a while for him. Um, he's a well-educated man. And yet, his view of the writing of poetry was no different than someone who would be less well-educated, right? Um, because there's this idea of poetry in the mainstream of America as, as easy. And it's, uh, there's also an idea that it's not real work and that you won't make money. So I think that's across the board. Right. Um, but I think that, uh, oddly enough, I think for the children of the very, very wealthy and for the children of the poor, less so in the middle, they get more <clears throat> tension and resentment right, because of it. Um, so I do think that there was some factor of uh, my not doing a, a real kind of work. But, but honestly, about uh, 10 years ago, he's like, you work harder than anyone I know. You know, why are you still so poor? You know, <laughs> so, so poetry takes time, you know. Uh, so he, he's changed his mind. Uh, he had me when he was young, and I feel like we grew up together. And um, I don't know if he feels that, but that's how I feel. And um, we've been having a discussion, he and I, uh, about art. And he took the route that said, I'm going to let it go for a while. And that wound up being almost his whole life. And I took the route that said, I'm not going to let it go, not even for a second, no matter what happens. And 
made other kinds of sacrifices to stay with that art. So yeah, I think between us, that, that's a roiling kind of, you know, a lot of, a lot of anger. And then he raised me as a northerner, but he's a southwesterner, and in, in, in many ways a southerner. So there was that too. So I had, let's say, Yankee hubris. I'm like, well, I went to school and they said, you can't spank me, you know? <laughs> Spanking, the belt, that's the culture of the whip, you know? <laughs> you know? I'm, I'm, I, you know, and he's looking at me like, what? You know? And my cousins are talking to me like, what's wrong with you? Where do you come from, you know? So, so we, had, um, we had several things to work through to, to reach this time right now where I feel that he's truly seeing me in, in, in my power, in my agency. I, I'm very fortunate, very fortunate to have that happen. I lost my mother uh, end of last year, and she and I did not get to work through enough, unfortunately, but I do have the opportunity with my father, so um, yeah, that's what it, he's grown a lot, and he's grown to meet my vision of him, you know. Do you think that your mother should make the next book? I dedicated the second book, Horse in the Dark, to her because I wrote about her part of the world. We buried her in the piney woods of East Texas, and I wrote about having lived in those piney woods, which um, I still love, and love. I love the women that come out of those piney woods, um, you know, especially the big bosomed women and those wide laps, and you just curl up in them. I love those women. Um, uh, but these conversations that we were just having right now, do you think that will make the next one different? My conversations with my mother won't. My conversations with Greg will. Um, honestly, I think you've informed so much of, he, he's informed so much of my thinking um, Gregory was the first brother of color I ever met who recognized the fullness of my mind. And do you know that? That's true. See? Ah, I'm going to cry now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You answer the question. Well, I'm, just, I'm thinking how much um, estrangement has to do with the, the resentment that we're talking about. And so there's a, um, we were talking earlier. Um, you know, there's a, the ambition gets read as rejection. Uh, so what do you think? You're better than me now? What, you know, uh, and I'm thinking, and maybe kind of obvious, but the, this whole Richard Rodriguez kind of, you know, the, the oh, yeah. moving, mm -hmm. you know, how, um, how education estranges us from the language of home and domesticity and, uh, and, and intimacy. Um, yeah, I don't, um, <laughs> I'm trying to piece it together from there, but uh, the resentment that comes out of that. You know, the other thing I was thinking too was my, so my brother is, um, is a musician and he was a rather famous musician. Uh, for a time, and <clears throat> that narrative is perfectly fine, right? As if you are... You know, it is perfectly <laughs> fine. I, I sang before Poetics. I, I lost my singing voice to cancer, but when I was singing, nobody African-American gave me any flat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, you sing, girl, that's so good. Nobody, ma why didn't no one mind that, perfor that performative art? No one, no one minded. Yeah. Why yeah. is it okay to sing? Well, because well, you can make money. Well, I think it has to do with that, but it also has to do with the, I think, the associations of, uh, the associations with familiar narratives of Familiarity, race. Yeah. Right, and again, when we, when we start to talk about uh, the, the divergences from these traditional uh, and conventional narratives of, of mm -hmm. the, the performance of race, then we, people start to take offense on the one hand, and people start to get threatened on the other hand. And so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's this resentment that has to be negotiated. Let me go one in the back. She's had a wonderful uh, amount of time.
then who else has questions? There was one in the further back, too. How are we doing on time, by the way? Okay, okay, cool. This conversation has really been very, very... Okay. Okay, okay. Very rich, um, making me think about my parents, especially my father. Uh, my father would have been 96 this coming Sunday had he lived, and he, uh, he passed away at 67. And one of the things as I think about him is I wish he had lived, uh, not only you know, so he would be here, but so that I could have argued yeah. with him a lot more about things, um, because I'm of your parents' age group. Uh, and uh, he didn't quite understand me as a woman, a woman of the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, oh, he didn't understand imagine. me as a woman um, who it wasn't important just to have a job. I mean, for him, you needed to have a job so you could take care of yourself. Uh, the idea of having a career that was just not part of his mm -hmm. vocabulary mm -hmm. at all, uh, not only for me, but also for my brother, but especially for a woman. And, and even as a career, if you're going to think about that, I was very uh, slotted into what I could do and what I would be capable of doing. Uh, so um, it's just a very, very different world. I just thought, uh, I just felt very constricted most of the time. And as I'm getting older, because <laughs> now I'm 71, and I think back, um, I'm working on a lot of forgiveness, you know, and letting go of resentment because uh, they were people of their the generation. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They had come through a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they accomplished a great mm -hmm. deal um, coming from South Carolina, Jim Crow South, um, coming north, getting jobs, raising families. We were never on welfare and could have been, but right. you know, this was part of the pride that they brought with them. And so there were lots of things to um, thank them for, mm -hmm. you know. But it was, I, I'm just different, you know. He was always a poor boy who had done good, even though he had a couple of Cadillac cars, built his own house, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> et cetera. And at a certain point, I had to say to myself, I am not poor. I am very middle class, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and I have very middle class values. Um, but also um, appreciate uh, the heritage, because there's a rich heritage, you know, and a lot of it comes out of religion also. Um, and so there's just so many things that make me different uh, from them, um, but, but also very alike, like them in many, many ways, sure. that as I get older, I can see the similarities. Can uh, I ask and you I can see, yes. how you're, so in thinking back, mm -hmm. right, and, and the forgiveness, I wonder how we are, if we recognize that we are all people of our time, of our generation, shaped by our, our own particular consequences, how are we thinking toward the future? How are we thinking, what, what kinds of, is it, is, there, is it necessary to project that kind of forgiveness forward? Well, I think forgiveness is a major process. First of all, I have to be in touch with my resentment. I have to be yeah. in touch with my anger and own it. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, perhaps let it go. You're, and you're then speaking that's for process. a larger, yeah, the yeah. larger and experience as you, here. And, yeah. as you, and I think as uh -huh. you go through that process, um, what is important and what has informed my life and now, you know, being very, very selfish, um, holding on to that stuff doesn't make my life better. In fact, it probably detracts from my life by holding on to that stuff. So, so now I'm more mature. You know, I've thought through a lot, I've worked through a lot of stuff. My parents did not have therapy. They never thought in terms of therapy, I had therapy. I remember my mother saying to me, you know, well, I don't have a psychiatrist. Well, I didn't have a psychiatrist, I had a psychologist. But in any case, she didn't have someone to sit down and talk about some of right, these things right. with. So I had a whole different, uh, yeah. I had a lot of resources that were available to sure, me sure. that were not available to yeah. her. And I yeah. need to remember that also when yeah. I talk well, about the giving I, I want to push back on that a little bit. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you why, because, you know, language, that's, that's what I have. That's my gift. That's the, that's the thing I'm paying attention to. When people of color talk about this, they never take a step forward without taking a step back. So you say, I'm different. But that's OK, because they were good to me. I'm different. But they gave me gifts. I assume that. I already believe uh -huh. that you got those gifts. When, when I hear you at 71, and you're only slightly younger than my dad, and I want my dad to come and sit with you and chat with you. 
right? Because learning doesn't stop at 60. And because it doesn't stop at 60, I don't have to look back and continuously thank my father. What I have to do is sit at the table with him and say, look, this is where we can both grow. This is where you can grow. So I demand that my father continue to grow. And I'm very fortunate that he rises to that challenge. I don't think because he's 20 years older than me that he can't. And I'm listening to you, and you're the living proof of what I'm saying. So he has forgiven me. That's the forward progression for me. Not that I forgive him. He forgives me. And by forgiving me, at the same time, he forgives his father that, did, that contained him too much. He forgives me for breaking out of that container. Because now he understands that he, too, must break out of the container. Now we have a kind of relationship that we often don't allow each other in families of color because we're so busy saying thank you mm. that we, we, it's almost our own self erasure. So let's assume thanks. thanks. I have never, ever met the person of color yet that didn't, <laughs> have you? That hasn't happened. That wasn't thankful, but we can't, when you're talking, I, I just want to stop you periodically because I want to hear more about you. I assume that you, you, you just, your bearing seems respectful to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but you, you seem to have a, a bearing that's respectful. So if you tell me once, I'm grateful, I believe you. But that you keep saying it says that there's something trapping us. And all that space, that's for you. And I believe your parents would know that that that's for you. What, what's happened with my father is he's come to understand that space that I have to have. And he grew up in the South, that was quite patriarchal. He understands many things he wouldn't have had I not challenged him. We gave each other gifts. Mm -hmm. And he is a wise enough man now to realize that. And I don't think he wants me to spend my time saying thank you. I think he knows I'm grateful. But if you don't hear that I'm grateful, that's not me, right? Because I feel grateful, right? So, so I, I, would, I would say to you, um, at 71, you, you are the living proof of, of what I've been saying to my father. He's, he's grown in many ways, very smart man. But I'm asking him to expand in ways that are completely unexpected. And why shouldn't he expand just because he's in his 70s? He can do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Was we had one more question. In the, question? In the back. He was your question. Was your question. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's a burning question now? It's not burning. Go, well, go ahead. Yeah. Now it's burning <laughs> now for it's me. There. I want to know. <laughs> we'll cheat a little bit. It's good. It's going good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Stagnation, yeah.
now they're paid more than twelve dollars an hour. You know what I mean? So it's like, do you? And Twitter has only been one hundred and fifty years, right? But sometimes, and this might be me being young, but I feel oftentimes temptation is trying to find that specifically African Americans because of African Americans, but people of color seem to not be able to just get all the like, get onto the roof and you know be like, no, we don't have to. You know, we've been past this now. Now it's like, all right, we've recognized all the struggles that have been against us. What can we do now to get past that and become even farther than farther than us? That's what we can comment on. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, no, I think I think we we all understand that ceiling is is imagined. <laughs> you know, that there isn't a ceiling. We are we place the, we project the ceiling to be there. We imagine the ceiling there, and I think the the question is, what do we gain? What are what kinds of what sense of security do we gain by imagining that there is a ceiling? Now, that's not to say that there are no. Uh, there's no opposition. Obviously, there is, there are massive structural massive. <laughs> right? massive. Uh, yeah. uh, obstacles in the way. But I think there is, as I said, even the, the, among the those of us interested in thinking about a world, imagining a world in which that ceiling is not a final obstacle. You know, that's we or I'll speak very personally. I get labeled naive and Pollyanna, and you know, and so, <laughs> so there, there's. Um, I think it's just a matter of. Um, no, I, I can't reduce it that simply. I'll just say yes. We have uh, we have some ideological work to do. And you're 24. I mean, some of that work has to be done by your generation. I think know. it is being done. Yeah. I, well, I, yeah, that's very true. It is being done. It is being done. I'm very, um, maybe, maybe even more so than, than some of my peers. I'm, I'm really fired up by what's happening, the generation behind me, you know. And I married a man 13 years my junior for a reason, you know. <laughs> I like the way he thinks. I. I, it's more open, it's more expansive. He has, for him, even if the sky's not the limit, you, would, you wouldn't be able to tell him that because he's got this kind of fierce, I'm gonna work at it, I'm gonna get as far as I can with it, wherever that is, and he's a poet as well. So, a poet born in Detroit, so. Um, yeah. Shout outs, Matthew Olsman. <laughs> Matthew Olsman, yeah. shout out. God, the two of you are precious jewels, and I just Thank really save you really are, and I just really savor the conversation that you are and what you are to each other. I think the audience would agree. You just feel it, so I, it feels almost criminal. I have to put an end to it. I feel like the, I feel like the Grim Reaper. Like, how can I do this? But I do have to end it. But I thank you all for coming, and I thank our two wonderful guests. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.